many people here learn to type an exclamation point by typing a period, backspacing, and doing an apostrophe? <laughs> How many oh, wow, that's uh, recognized an L as a one? Yeah. <laughs> we have one typewriter that kids can type on, and they all start to hit the keys very gingerly as though it's a computer keyboard. <laughs> They're not used to the fact that we are strong because we have to really hit down on the keys. So that is an interesting thing about the linotype, which I, I think Jeff just learned. The linotype keyboard is extremely light touch. Um, the first time I sat down and went, I hit the E and like, four maps fell down. Because I was, you, you right, it's this big, giant, heavy duty machine, and it's actually an incredibly feather touch to do it. And when you see an operator that knows what they're doing, it's just the lightest touch when they're doing it. And that's very interesting to me that it's so incredibly light compared to a, um, a typewriter where that, you've got to put some force. Because you don't realize that it's gravity that's driving it. Yeah, right, right. All, right. What you're, just the, yeah, all it has to do is drop the matrix. Right, place. it just opens up the escapement to let the mat drop. Yeah. You're not actually like moving a type bar like a typewriter to like impress. You're just releasing something, so it's incredibly light touch. It's funny, yeah. I, was in, uh, I was in typewriter triangle, I guess I want to call it, which is there are, for some reason, one of the highest densities of typewriter stores, I think in the world, maybe outside of maybe New York City, something like that, that remain are in the western part of Washington State, not in Seattle. There's two in the small city of Bremerton on the Olympic Ooh. Peninsula, and then a new one opened in Port Townsend, Washington, where my parents live, which is a, a good hour and a half north. And so three in this fairly unpopulated part of the state. And um, I visited the Port Townsend one a few months ago with my parents, and the owner was taking time for his time. You want to try this out? And like, oh, I started fiddling around. And after a while, like the muscle memory came back. I'd spent so long doing this. And then I'm like, oh, yeah. And she's pulling down manuals. And I start going at it. And then she's like, wait a minute. Because I am I look, I mean, maybe now not quite that young. But I look too young to have learned on a manual. But I did. And uh, I used to type 100 words a minute on a manual. But, you know, 35 years ago. So, you know, I start going into it. And I was like, what's going on? I'm like, no, no. It's just my, my fingers have taken over. It took about 10 or 20. 20 minutes and you're back to that heavy, hard action and the rhythm of it as you have to release to avoid the uh, type bars colliding. It's so important too that, that you think about it, the typewriter, it was not until the typewriter that we ended the age of the scribe, mm. right? That until until the, then everything was the scrivener, if you will. Exactly. <laughs> so everything was handwritten and that was our muscle memory and our, and our connection to the brain and words. And then now, you know, I, I almost type in my sleep and there's a wonderful book. I'm, Presume, I don't know if you ever had them here, Matthew Kirschenbaum's uh, Track Changes. No, I don't have that. Oh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful book about the history of word processing. Oh, and he's track, a, changes. track Changes. Yeah, you, you ought to have Matthew. Yeah, he's, right. I will he's, yeah. he's wonderful. Uh, he's, yeah, he's a literary scholar. Yeah. It's from that perspective. Right. And how it changed. The typewriter led to the first moment where you could think that anyone could make something that would look perfect. Mm. Right. That, that typesetting was something that was done you know, in, 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 a, in a special place by people who own type cases, right? And now you could have TypeScript on a piece of paper. And that changed our, our relationship to text in critical ways, I think. Well, I thought this was Clefane's big observation as a stenographer, was he's he had a very particular remit. And this comes up sometimes, I'll get questions from uh, novelists, even, or authors, who asked, they're like, how did I make copies of something in the 1800s? And the answer is different at each time. And there were ways there were, um, Oh, what do you call those? There, there were duplicating machines you well, could use. Well, there was autography, right. where you wrote on uh, very liquid inks on small pieces of transparent paper and then transferred them. Mm -hmm. uh, then, then there were methods on lithostones, where you wrote right. on the lithostone. And with transfer lithostones, you could do right reading, yes. transfer wrong reading, and then transfer right reading. That's and that's what Clefane did, by the way. His company oh, yes. was called uh, Clefane and Company Autographers and, and Lithographers. <laughs> Uh -huh. Which was a brilliant idea. You have transfer stones here, and it's very confusing. Because lithography, you look at it, and you think it should be mirrored because right. you put the paper on it. I saw a, st a transfer stone yeah. years ago and said, why is the transfer stone right reading? And it was step and repeat. You could put it onto a bigger stone and That's then right. print a whole bunch at once. But so Clefane's observation or necessity was, I need to make a, I need to turn my shorthand into something that everyone can read, and I need to make a limited number of copies of it, and maybe a lot of copies. How do I do that? And he basically spent a chunk of his life funding or finding out how to do that. He actually sponsored someone else to invent a, a typewriter right. that could <laughs> type on a piece of paper with very liquid ink. 
Right. He could, and then he could transfer it from the paper to the litho stone. But the ink dried at different levels. So oh. they kept working on this. And that's why he found his way to this machine shop in Baltimore, because he needed to solve a problem. And that's when Mercantile said, you're going down the wrong road. It should be hot metal. But see, school Spain, well, but there's a ty already typewriter keys that are already typing to produce it. He knew that you wanted to have something mechanized as the input of it. So, so I, I do this with students all the time. I take out one little piece of type, and I say that for, for 400 years, every single word that was set in type in, in the world was set this way, right? And Doug can speak to this far better than I can, but it was not replaced until this, the matrix, right? And Mergenthaler's, we've talked about this, but, but, but the fact that he wasn't from the type-setting world, he wasn't from that, um, that mindset, and to realize that this took three te three steps, right? You had to, you had to design and, and create the, the matrix, the matrix and the letter. You had to compose it, and then you had to redistribute it. And so many of the machines that came beforehand tried to replicate one of those tasks. But we have a machine in the back that had a whole batch of those pieces of type. And as you keyboarded, they would fell, the, fell down. Oh, right. So it solves the problem of finding oh, the letter. Right. But you still had to have something composed. There were line. others that were invented trying to redistribute oh, things. And it was it was Mergenthaler's Eureka mm -hmm. was to say I could replace all three tasks if I could figure out a way to mold but the letters. He recapitulated the history of, well, I mean, Mergenthaler did with Clefane's funding, recapitulated the history of, of the 1800s, which was hey, we want to make, printers always want to make a lot of copies of things cheaply. They wanted to set the type once and correct it and then print that a bunch of times. And it was always difficult. And every time you couldn't have standing type because type that you kept out of use was non-productive, expensive, and every page weighed, I don't know, 10 pounds or something. So you couldn't have like a storage house full of 50,000 pounds of type. You couldn't afford it and you couldn't have enough room. So the stereotype or the, the hard, durable metal plate gets invented as an idea like over and over again. And finally, in the early 1800s, uh, Charles III, Earl, Earl of Stanhope invents or, or modifies perfects process that lets printers create a plaster mold and this uh, of, of a form of type and then cast that as a solid metal plate. And that becomes, that's a huge transformatory event. Mm -hmm. And it, so Clefane, you know, they're making stereotypes like crazy. They moved to a paper-based process by the 1850s, 1860s. Clefane's coming into this and says, well, the matrix, like, let's just punch stereotype matrixes. Right. We'll just punch it into paper. But well, okay, that doesn't work. What, you know, so we start with lithography. Let's punch it into paper, whatever. And Mergenthaler is going through each of these evolutions and saying, no, we need to have something that's mechanized, driven, and that produces as the output a thing that's a desirable result. But they go through, I mean, really, well, Clefane and then with Moore, the original inventor, and then Mergenthaler, like, Four generations, and again, perfect. Or well, we have the second band that. machine, which is the second prototype out in front. But the first band machine had all the letters on a band, and they were all in relief. And they yes. were pressed into a paper mache, and then they would cast a line from that. Very cumbersome approach. There's one example of that surviving in Rochester or something? You can see pictures No, it's of actually that. at the Smithsonian in storage. Oh, of course. Uh, but here's here's, here's one weird thing from, I learned when, when I was... Uh, researching my book, is good. there's one theory uh, that says that Gutenberg actually did the first stereotyping. Oh. For the Catholicon, which was printed after the Bible, um, uh, Paul Needham at Princeton analyzed, and he tried to find why there were things that were in common or different, just two lines at a time. And basically the theory is that he stereotyped, he molded from the type, two lines at a time and held them. And then another researcher found hammer nail heads evident so that they were nailed in. So that, because the problem with typesetting is, you, again, you make it, you compose it, you redistribute it. The redistributing is a pain in the ass. <laughs> you need a new edition. You got to do the whole thing all over again. So how could you come up with a method of preserving the work once you've done it, right? It seems so obvious. It didn't come until the 1800s. So that if, if, if Gutenberg actually experimented with that and for whatever reason dropped it, hmm. and, it and it stayed dropped for 500 years, 400 years, that's just amazing. This is, I just had a conversation uh, a week or so ago, contemporary breaking news from the 1500, 15th century <laughs> is, uh, with Paul Nash, who is uh, editor of a journal in England. And he's working, he's got a book coming out that is covering this in part. And because I'm working on, I have a chapter of a book in preparation 
Uh, my chapter's on strangely stereotyped matrices and plates. You wouldn't know it from what I'm talking about today. Um, and uh, I said, uh, so if so, he's looked into this. A lot of people have looked into the Catholicon stereotyping to say, did this really happen? And I said, so so you know, we're 30 years almost after Needham put this forward. Um, what do you think? And his the the top line conclusion is it probably wasn't very cost effective. So even though yeah, it seems yeah. like it would be, it takes until the 1700s for real experiments to go into place, and it's rediscovered three times, maybe four times, and maybe more. And I think in the end, it only becomes effective when it, there's a commercial. We keep coming back. There's a commercial repetitive production process, probably that's tied to metallurgy and refinement in uh, mechanical. Uh, like tooling, and that's what gets. Well, us well, I was also I, I like that theory because because it also says that there wasn't sufficient scale to justify it yet. Yeah, right? When you go along, when you get Harper Brothers who helped develop electroplating and other methods of stereotyping, because they have a scale, scale with the steam powered press, scale with stereotyping, scale with cheap paper, and all that meant that now mm -hmm. to save a plate of something. And reuse it meant you could produce a lot more copies, but that wasn't the market wasn't that big. Then. Saved Harper and Brothers because they were big into electrotyping and stereotyping in the 1850s. They have a huge fire started with like you know benzene or something. Their old building burns down, but they have a number of their stereotype plates, electrotype plates are at printers, and this saves them because they're able to print those editions. And within a few years, they have a new, the fanciest ten-story building or something in in uh, in New York, and it's the most fireproof building ever made. <laughs> and they built extensive vaults that hold, held uh, hundreds of thousands of st of stereotypes and electrotypes, and also with fire doors. Also, so if there had ever a fire again, ever ever event, their gold was in those vaults. And they the, huge, the huge, the uh, huge steam-powered machines were mm -hmm. out outside, so they couldn't cause the fire. Out. I mean, no, uh, cool. And electrotyping took off because of Nathaniel Hawthorne. No. Well, what That's happened great. was the publisher, <laughs> the printer, um, they printed a small number because they didn't think the book would sell. And then they redistributed all the type. And when the book became a success, then they had to reset all the oh types. So when they discovered electrotyping, publishers after that, did, in fact, most of Mark Twain's books were printed with electrotype plates. Hmm. In fact, we have some in the store that we sell from a book that was done. <laughs> um, that solved the problem. So they would save the plates, and if there was a reprint, they didn't have to set oh, the type again. And it's accuracy too, right? So some of the earliest uses of stereotyping, don't get me, I don't get too far off keyboards, I swear. <laughs> Tables of logarithms, off key. ship charts, like all the mathematical stuff, they're mm -hmm. like, we're gonna fix it once, and if there's a problem, we're gonna solder out a stereotype and solder in new metal, and, and then they, we're gonna print for this from 100 years if we could. Hmm. Again, they found ways around it. Yeah. But let's stay on keyboards. <laughs> all right. All right. We, we're, we're now at the age, what I'm going to call word processing. The, the next major, after the typewriter, the next major iteration is the word processing machine. So you have the IBM MTST, which has a typewriter, a selectric, connected to a unit with a mag tape cassette. So you record everything as you're going along, you can make changes, you can edit. And the keyboard now is somewhat different, is it not? Because <laughs> now you have functions that you time didn't have on a typewriter. Yeah, you know what? I want to go back in time a little bit more. Okay. Is that okay? Because it actually goes back to what, to what we were talking about. So the uh, this is the sort of professional era of word processing, right? Like you can see, I think we don't. There's no MTST here, but there's the uh, some of the successors, right? The selector composer. There's one more. I have the selector composer. There. Yeah. But uh, the, the original story of like word processing, if you squint a little bit and if you like put quotation marks, goes back a little bit further in time, which is basically like the, the auto typists and like uh, it's sort of like the player piano typewriters. Ah, we should explain what an auto typist is. It's a typewriter connected to a piano player role. Yeah. And you would type, have your material on that role, you would put your blank paper in, you would type the name and address, you would hit the button, and it would type out a form letter for you. Mm. Yeah, and the reason for that is actually like one of the biggest reasons that this happened was mm -hmm. advertising. Because if you got an advertising uh, circular printed on one of the linotypes or whatever, you would know that like a million people got the same thing because the scale, <laughs> you, you can't do it. But if you if you have an electric typewriter with like a little bit of a form, you can, it feels like somebody typed it for you, right. even though it was already like automatic, and it caught people's attention. It's like, that, oh, that, somebody so had the bite, the bite on the paper. Oh, yeah. Can I, can I sidebar for one brief second, which was the sidebar. funny, the sidebar of the sidebar, the one funny thing that came out in your book as I was editing it that I thought was hilarious is 
when people, because of this duplication problem, it was hard to make copies of things unless you had typesetters, it was expensive and you need to print a lot of something or some reasonable quantity. So when the typewriter came out, people would get letters typewritten and they would say, don't go to the expense of having printed this for me because in their yes. minds, what's a typewriter? Anything that's printed had to come from a yes. typesetting. There were also type to be used for Ooh. Printing presses that look like typewriters yes. to fool people into it was the whole thing. But to go to uh, go back to Frank's question, I think maybe I don't know what you. Uh, there's many aspects to it, but I think this is the first time in the uh, MTST and the selector composer and stuff like that that I think the words of because typewriters are horrible with typography, right? Mm -hmm. They have monospace letters. The L looks like one, as we talked about. They're 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 you know I think maybe there's a person in the room who's who research two spaces, one space, three spaces after a dog. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, Thomas. Yeah, so so there's there's controversies around the team three spaces. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, and 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 generally like not beloved, right? Like that, but uh, I, I think this is the first time where like the 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 words of typesetting and the words of keyboards mm -hmm. like start to kind of collide, where you start seeing actually quotation marks that are going into different directions. You start seeing a justification or you start seeing um, different dashes or maybe even fonts at some point, like uh, maybe not with the, with the bolts, with the selectric, but then you still have monospace. But you start sort of seeing a slow convergence that eventually gets us to- I, I want to ask Doug a question about this time period. Go right ahead. Yeah. Um, when ITU members kept their jobs and switched to photo, comp photo composition, yeah. And they had to switch from the Edelon shirt blue to the QWERTY. Yeah. What was oh, that like for them? So, so, yeah, so the, the professional typists of the age. So that's the thing. So you have these operators who are part of the International Typographic Union, which especially in New York City is the most powerful union in the country. It was also the first union in the United States. So all these operators know this Edelon shirt blue keyboard. And all of a sudden, all of these new photo machines are all QWERTY layout and a different layout. And recently, just recently, I've really been trying to think of like, what was that like for the people? Like, how did that feel? And so what I think is, if someone said tomorrow, you have to use a Dvorak keyboard yeah. to write your next blog post, that would be terrifying. Yeah. That would be actually really scary. You couldn't even log, couldn't even log in. Because yeah. yeah, like I just, <laughs> like that would be really difficult. So what the oh union God. did, they were very worried about their operators. So what happened at that transition time was that they either retired and there's several people that are just like, I'm not learning that new keyboard and that no. new technology. They lost their job and went into something totally different. Or the ITU, the, the union, fought for jobs for life for these people that worked in the composing oh. rooms. And and uh, just recently I learned I from that, Glenn, yeah. the last person at the New York Times who had a job for life from 1978 just retired in 2016. <laughs> so there was like a really young guy that had just joined the union wow. and he had a job for life at the New York Times guaranteed until 2016. But, but he had to learn every technology. So he finished right. up doing InDesign. Here's the, the thing I'll tell you, there's a great thing. This is again, I'm sorry, I'm gonna sidebar you briefly, which is, it ties into that, which is, um, uh, the site center unions were very, very powerful because it was such a specialized thing. You couldn't just bring in scabs. There were no scabs. There were some people off to the side, yeah, you... but there were never sufficient numbers to do anything and you couldn't send it out for daily papers. So they had this practice called bogus copy. You know all about oh, this, God, right? Bogus. Yeah. So bogus yeah. copy, also called dead horse copy, which is a great term. That's and it great. dates back to the 1850s, 60s, something like that. And it was, if type came in from out of house, uh, well, there are two kinds. One is if type came in from out of house, like an advertiser delivered type in some format, the typesetter union reserved the right to reset that type or be given time in lieu of it. And they would basically put it on a spike and say like, this is the bogus copy. If they had downtime, they're supposed to set this copy and then throw it away. The other was when they had downtime and they were paid by piecework, particularly in the 19th century, they had to be set to work. They weren't, they, they could be idle, but the shops didn't like paying them to be idle and there were rules about that. So the bogus copy practice 
continues until 1970 something mm -hmm. and is part of the transition to cold type bogus copy is thrown out but i just but the it's the case it even went to the supreme court in the 1950s the they were uh, the union was assailed for feather bedding or, or paying people for not doing anything and this guy retired in 2016 as part of that group essentially ultimately is is what the Supreme Court said is, no, they're doing work. It doesn't matter if you don't like the work, you negotiated for it, they are required to perform it, and they are compensated on it. Feather bedding is when you don't do work. So all the stories about five guys in a press room standing there and you know st standing around, the typesetting union had solved it, and it wasn't eliminated for essentially a century until that transition. We must, we must tell everybody that the reason the union existed mm. was because of the Etoy the Etoy Schurdle keyboard mm. because every linotype was standardized. Every yeah. intertype machine was right. the same keyboard. Right. Therefore, once you were trained on that, you had a job for life. You could go anywhere in the United States with your union card and have a job immediately. That keyboard was the standard way that they got jobs and they ran. But so was the type case. That, right. Yes, the, so we went from the type case to the keyboard. Right. <laughs> Right. But once the keyboard started to change, because no two That's photo typesetting machines were the same, then the union couldn't handle uh, that. And that yeah. was the last nail in the coffin for the unions. It was also true that when, when so before the linotype, one of my favorite stories is there were speed typesetting contests. That's right, the Swifts. Mm -hmm. Swifts, right? Yeah. And and it was it was phenomenal that people would pay money to go watch somebody right. set type, right? <laughs> um, the no, old days in, in, in uh, Haverhill. The next door um, you could do the paint drying competition. Right, exactly. Yeah, right. 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 So the ITU wisely, in, in a John Henry moment, stopped speed typesetting because they knew it would lose to the machine. It would make them look bad, right? But what they the, the brilliance of the ITU, and it's a fascinating part of the story, which I think we'll probably both end up telling, mm -hmm. is that when the line of came in, the ITU said, well, we're either screwed or we're gonna be in charge. So we're gonna insist that our members are the ones who operate this machine, right? And, and that's just the way it is. When photo composition came, instead they said, no, we're gonna stop this machine. Yeah, that's and right. That's what killed them. Yeah, like right. if the ITU would have seen and said, oh yes, these people are our people, these people, using uh, QWERTY keyboards. But what they said is, oh, that's right. secretary work. Yeah. Oh, that's not proper typesetting. And so, exactly, they said, no, these people aren't part of us. If they would have said, yes, photo composition, and we, you know, we'll retrain our members, and this is still our union, I think the ITU would still exist today in some form or fashion. So, no, by the way, the union did try to do that. Oh. Uh, they acquired a linofilm from Linotype. Yes. They assumed that because it was Linotype that the linofilm would become a dominant machine. They installed one out at the training facility, but it, it was a bomb of a machine. Yeah. And then they realized yeah. no one was going to dominate the photo typesetting market. So I was at the Chicago Tribune when we, um, I was a very young pup uh, when we uh, were still on Linotype and we still had photo composition and we got our first computers. And I was telling this story to somebody earlier today. And so I didn't realize it. I, I was the kid who was working the midnight shift waiting for somebody to die so I could write about it. Um, and I sat next to the machine and I played with it. So I was the one, only person in the newsroom who was scared of it. And I ended up training the whole newsroom. And, and I trained, you know, the, what is a cursor? This is a cursor. No, I told the story to these guys. No, when you get to the end of the line, don't, there's no return. No, just keep typing, right? It was, it was mind blowing for them, right? Well, I didn't realize was it was a scab system. They were trying to break the oh. ITU. Mm -hmm. And so we started uh, writing on this system and the, uh, the output of it was a line printer. And the copy kids would tear off the stuff, set it down to the composer room where it would be re-keyboarded. Oh, right. wow. Until we came up to a new contract. Right, which is such a waste of, of energy and resources. It ridiculous. Like it's already printed, it's ready to go, or it's already like typed out that you can, yeah. that you can lay it out. Yeah. But the yeah. kind of McKenzie uh, wording at the time was the economic goal was to save keystrokes. Right? So the writer would type, would type in, why would someone re-keystroke that? We're gonna so, save that. So this is really interesting because I, uh, in a sort of, we, we, we keep navigating between these two universes. One is sort of the office typewriter uh, documents and one is printing, typesetting and stuff like that. And I, it, what's really interesting, and maybe some people recognize in the room, but I think collectively we forgot in the office space, right? In the typewriter, electric typewriter, eventually like very early word processing machines, like maybe not MTST, but like uh, 
some of the you know early screens you know that eventually became personal computers in the eighties. Um, how much before the backspace as we know it today arrived? How much of typing was constantly retyping? How much like your boss, usually a guy, oh, I changed my mind, changes one word, and then the secretary, usually a woman, in America at least, or in the Western world, like would have to type it again and type it again and type it again. And 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 how how like you know with there was not that much consideration because it was uh, sort of a differential in power. And how many at the same time, uh, often actually led by women. Uh, companies and institutions trying to invent erasing typos, mm -hmm. right? Trying to, uh, you know, liquid paper, trying, like to chemicals, to, to whatnot, trying to sort of fix this thing that would solve this problem of people having to type and retype and retype over and over again before it's perfect and before it can be duplicated or whatever. And we, we should mention, by the way, the round red erasers with the brush on the end. Yeah. yeah. The gray uh, erasers that look like pencils with a brush on the end. Yeah. The correction papers that you typed over the character. And the greatest invention in the history of mankind, whiteout. <laughs> and horrible, erasable paper. That never That's really correct. Wrong. Wait, what is that? Erasable paper? It was, it was slimy paper. Uh, it was it was typed paper and it had this weird coating on it where you supposedly you could erase the ink, oh. and it oh. smelled different. Um, <laughs> wow. And and if you go on eBay to this day, it's a collector's item. You know you, you can't find it. Um, it was oh, even boy, I got something on you. I don't know. That it was a brand. It was Eaton Caraceable paper. Mm -hmm. So I was when I was at the Chicago Tribune, I was on rewrite. Right, it's a prison break. Call in. I take the notes. I write it, and we would write on what was called half books. Right, half piece paper. Do a paragraph. You'd yell, copy, which always felt to somebody who was one year younger than me, would take the paper around <laughs> because it had to go through a process, right? I had to go to the city editor, I had to go to the copy desk, I had to go downstairs, I had to get typeset, I had to get proofread, right? And so while I'm doing the, the 20th paragraph, some of us already set in type, right? Wow. And, 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 and of course, the skill was, you had, did I already say the first reference? I had a carbon. Did I say the first reference? Did I, oh, shoot, I didn't say that. It's too late. I can't change it. In comes the computer in 1974. And suddenly, the time shifted. Right mm -hmm. now, I, I had a deadline still, but I could write as fast as I could because I learned to write fast. And then I used every minute to edit. Yeah, it mm -hmm. fundamentally, like, just like the keyboard, fundamentally changed from handwriting. That fundamentally changed how I would think and how I wrote. Mm -hmm. I became more of an editor than a writer. And some people hated this, right? Some people oh, yes. were like, oh, oh yes. we're going to continue overriding and just over, like overthinking this. It's And some people still say, like, I like the typewriters because I have to think and then I put it on paper and I'm done. I work like you where I can. I'm like, I start editing the moment I have three words. <laughs> Go up and down. It's a mess until it's not. Like, it always feels like almost done for like 99% of time and then it's done. And that's how I work. So I cannot, I couldn't use a typewriter, but I also appreciate people who, do it That's also why I love Medium, mm -hmm. because it's if you haven't used Medium, it's just a beautiful interface. It oh, even when I write dumb, it looks smart, right? <laughs> wow. It looks better. <laughs> I got a quick sidebar question for you. Gutenberg, the when, when hyphenation was used, the hyphen was outside of the type on the right. Okay. Medium, it's also yeah. the only other place I've ever seen that mm -hmm. where the hyphen is outside of the column on the on the on the right. Was that purposeful in some way? It's um, that's because in design, by the way, that was one of the major features. Yeah. Oh, was it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, then, I never knew that. Stop. Do um, people use it? Yeah. No. 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 Okay. <laughs> I, I think I think yeah. that uh, somewhat, but I think the challenge with like doing any, anything on the web, uh, which is like you really co also constrained by like how much the browsers uh, allow you to do mm -hmm. things and how much the operating system. Yeah. So I don't know if it was even consistent. Like I I remember like uh, like I went to hell and back to do quotation marks that look, they are curved. Yeah. I literally personally made a change to Chrome the browser to, so they don't appear in spell check because spell check was only understood dumb quotes. The moment you use that smart quote, it would say like, oh, you're doing something wrong. And so at Medium, if we change your dumb quotes to smart quotes to make you look good, you would start seeing underlines, oh. red underlines. So I had to personally ah, ah. patch the browser. So that, that, some of the challenges, wow. I'm sure like, you know, the, the really, huge linotypes here and other machines 
they had like versions of those kind of hacks and challenges, but like in the world of chemistry or metallurgy or whatever, we always fight with those with those mediums, no pun intended, just to like have them do what we want to do. And sometimes we lose parts yeah. in the process, right? I, I want to bring up one thing, I know we're going to do questions soon, but it's, um, we've talked about it a little bit in passing, but it's the gender split is that uh, the union, I mean, we're talking about, I mean, typewriters, were part of the introduction of women into the workforce, although it took decades for that to happen. And the typesetting side, the, the unions kept women out more or less. There were sometimes auxiliary unions in the it was 1880s, 1870s. There was an auxiliary union in New York that yep. was yep. that had, was prominent, but it's still um, there's a book called The Swifts that talks. There's a great chapter on that. Yeah, yes. Um, but but women were kept out of typesetting, mm -hmm. and it was so there. And there were ultimately men left, you know, these office typing and secretary jobs, and those became women's work, right? And so part of the transition to cold type and then to photo typesetting was women were brought in because they were paid less. They were paid sometimes. That's how women got into yeah. the printing industry through photo typesetting. Because those ver the verotypers wow. were often operated by women before the full photo typesetting version for like setting real, co like ma massive amounts of copy and uh, graphic means, which you can see on a loop in the other room by Briar Levitt, uh, a film, um, I think she said it was 50% of the pay and also no benefits, you didn't have the That's union correct. protections. And so part of this history of, of typesetting and, and the keyboard and Martina's yeah. entire chapter about it is this, uh, you know, gender divide on pay and benefits. And then it's, you know, it's still to this yeah. day, we don't really, you know, typesetting disappeared. Um, I was, I have a great story because I was, trained as a typesetter by a woman who had learned herself um, when she had run away from home to New York at age 15. She gets there, finds a job typesetting under the counter 16. She was paid, uh, she's working photos, early phototype in the 70s. She was paid 2 dollars an hour and she noticed the women around her, it was all women, were getting paid 3 dollars an hour and she couldn't find out why. Well, the place was setting smutty books and they said, oh, you get 2 dollars an hour if you typeset the books, you get 3 dollars an hour if you write them while you're typesetting. <laughs> so in, in my book on the history of photo typesetting, I have a chapter called The Girl and the Union. Mm. Because they, they would say, get a girl to do that. You know, it was yeah. a menial job. But once the keyboards changed and they were curdy based women got in. And they then built themselves up. They started businesses. They started printing companies. And now today, the printing industry is more than half women, oh, that's great. which there's, is fantastic. There's a great uh, engraving. I can't remember exactly where it was. Uh, Shoals. Uh, being treated as kind of a hero to yes. women. There's like angels coming down because, because he enabled women to come to work uh, and change life. Well, well the that first demonstrator was his daughter, right? Have that? Yeah, I have it. I have mixed feelings about all of this. So so there's definitely like in the world of the offices, right? There's this... Not about women in the workplace. No, 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 no. no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, the, the, the mythology of like typewriters help women a lot, which... which let, first of all, let's get credit, let's give credit to women, not typewriters. Yeah. But also, I think the upward mobility of being like a you know first a secretary and then they disappeared almost almost immediately yeah. after typewriters happened. So so there was the introduction, but there was also like a lot of limits. And then you know there was this sort of like underground bunkers with secretaries retyping stuff that came from above, looking at like very early CRT monitors that were like really not good for your eyes. And so so there's like a lot of like really unpleasant history there. And also the sort of when the 80s came and you start seeing personal computers, of which there are many in the gallery, they start making their way into offices. And for the first time you start seeing uh, like decades, for many, many decades, typing was like a woman's job, like out of sight. And the computer manufacturers actually very deliberately try to tell men, typing is cool, you're not gonna look like, uh -huh. Like uh, weak when you sissy. type, yeah. And the, the, if you if you know this, look at all of the advertisements of the computers in the early eighties, and how often it is a guy typing, and a woman standing in the back and looking like, yeah, you're my man. <laughs> like, I, I have respect for it. Like I have like five examples in my book alone wow. of that visual. Yeah. And so the sort of early shows kind of sitting to a typewriter, and women sort of like, oh my god. I don't know, <laughs> a little bit of a tricky thing. And by the way, Scholz was like not involved in that. That came right, from right, right. from yeah, the yeah. historical life. He, he, like, really lost yeah, he, yeah. He, he was actually, for, from all that I know, he he didn't want to be considered that sort of like myth of, yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny, they, they named a park after him in Milwaukee. And after 40 years, everyone said, who's Scholz? And they changed it to someone else's name. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> so there's only one one monument in Milwaukee about Schultz. That's it. Doug, will you tell people that you're uh, devoting much of your life to the Latin type? How often do people say the what? 
Oh, nobody knows what the linotype is. Really? Oh. Yeah, no, no, like, how this... many people here know what a linotype is? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the I thing... smell it from here. Yeah. <laughs> this is the thing about the linotype, um, and I was talking with Jeff or, or Glenn about it, is like, so Mergenthaler, the inventor of the linotype, the inventor of something that absolutely revolutionized the world, in my mind, and in the same league as Thomas Edison, as Henry Ford, as we as Westinghouse, as Firestone, but people don't know Mergenthaler as a name. And I think part, my biggest theory is that it's because he created something that wasn't a consumer yes. uh, consumable, mm -hmm. right? Like he made, he made the machine that made the consumable, which oh, was gosh. newspapers, but Ford made, you know, Ford made the car, uh, Eastman made the Kodak camera. Those were all consumer goods. And so I think Mergenthaler should be in that pantheon of those those names of those inventors in the late 19th yeah. century, but he just isn't. And no one cared how the newspaper was made. They just cared that it was on their, on their doorstep at 7 a.m. They really didn't know it didn't care. And it's kind of the same, I think, myself. Like before, I didn't know where newspapers came from. I didn't know that sort of thing. So like, yeah, um, no, nobody knows what yeah, the linotype yeah. is when it's I tell them not, that. Yeah. Um, it's also a weird German name. It's it's a, yeah, he he also died young. Like it's a, he's a very interesting And he was a character. Frank too, so. He, he was also <laughs> pretty I mean, he was, he was a perfectionist. He was a Scholes and Mergenthaler would have been best friends except they would have been worst enemies. Yeah. Because they had, but, but, but Mergenthaler like, you know, I've read his, uh, Doug referred me to his autobiography. That's a biography as if it wasn't written by him. And it's fascinating to see like the litany of things he's always complaining, but often rightly so. Yeah. But I think he left behind him this people like Clefane is the only person who I think tried to preserve his invention. Not many yeah. other people who knew him really were like, you know, like, yeah, let's make sure Otmar isn't forgotten. So, right. That might be and I mean, I think Clefane is a very fascinating person. I know you, you know, wrote a whole book trying to like establish Clefane. Um, the fact that he had this hand in the typewriter and in the linotype, these two really revolutionary machines, which again are interestingly, one yeah. is very consumer based with the typewriter and one is very production based with the linotype. Um, I just think that's fascinating as, as a person that he was, he just seemed to always understand that there was a better way to do things. And, and he could tie yeah. those people together to do that. I think, and I have a lot of respect for that. There was also, well, what strikes me about Clefane was, was we talked about this, there was a decency and loyalty to him. He kept Mergenthaler, as the company was leaving Mergenthaler, or Mergenthaler left the company, and then the company left Mergenthaler kind of in the same, same way, and, and there was a there was a, a, a split there. Clefane kept the relationship with both sides. He was on the board of the company. Yeah. He was a friend of Mergenthaler's. Yeah. There was clear affection and loyalty there, yeah. and it made the machine better, too. It made yeah. the company yeah. better than the machine better. And by the way, yeah. Doug discovered the letters that were written to Clefay by Mergenthal, complaining yeah. about everything you could imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>